the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today the Church remembers St. Gregory Palamas as one of the greatest of the, of the Holy Fathers, one of the greatest of the uh, defenders of Orthodoxy. And uh, in a sense today is another Orthodoxy Sunday. Uh, last, last Sunday, of course, we proclaimed the, uh, the victory over iconoclasm and the, uh, and the restoration of the icons. And this Sunday, uh, we, we celebrate St. Gregory Palamas and his, and his standing up against uh, the West, <laughs> basically. His standing up against uh, the corrosive aspects of, uh, of uh, scholasticism and against the uh, and against all that all that was being impo- trying to be imposed uh, by the Western Church uh, on Orthodoxy as a, uh, actually as a bribe and a false bribe at that uh, for their uh, to get them to submit. Um, uh, about 300 years before uh, St. Gregory lived, you had the, you had the, the 1054 um, uh, break in communion, and then in the uh, 13th century, you had uh, the Crusades in which uh, the, uh, the Latin Crusaders came, and instead of uh, going and fighting the Muslims, they raided Constantinople and destroyed it. And there was hardly... A, it was basically only a shadow that was left. They destroyed the, 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 that, uh, the ancient Roman Christian Empire. Um, and uh, so a hundred and some years after that, the, eventually, the Greeks eventually got Constantinople back. Um, and this, this period was uh, in the 1340s and uh, 1350s is the period when St. Gregory uh, was was very active. The empire was reduced from uh, the whole Mediterranean basin to simply being Constantinople and Thessalonica, um, two cities. Uh, the rest was either uh, uh, being occupied by uh, crusaders um, and these little little princedoms and kingdoms uh, uh, that they had established all over the place, subjecting the the local people, and or it was uh, under under the Islamic yoke, which was a very bitter thing, very bitter thing. Um, uh, you all heard about what ISIS was doing in in Syria. Well, that's what the Islamic yoke was like. Um, and so, in the midst of this, uh, there's Saint Gregory Palamas, who uh, had lived as. He grew up in a very kind of privileged um, position. His father had been, the, I believe, the tutor uh, to the emperor's children, um, and had, which was, of course, uh, a position of great, great respect and I'm sure great wealth. And uh, if you try and read the writings of Saint Gregory in Greek, uh, you will know that he was very highly educated because they're virtually impenetrable. Um, uh, they're very, they're very complex. They're very philosophically sophisticated, and um, well, that, he re, he used his education well. Um, but when he, when, but when he was young, um, his parents decided to uh, go to separate monasteries, and so his dad took the boys, and his mom took the girls, and. They went went to separate monasteries, and Saint Gregory was, uh, in his later uh, uh, later childhood, was raised in the monastery, and and embraced the monastic life himself uh, when he was in, when he was of age, and having having done that, he excelled uh, in the spiritual life. He later uh, went on to become the abbot of uh, Espigmenu Monastery. Um, and uh, then he retired to a cave uh, to be a hesychast, which is the highest form of spiritual life. And it was during this period in his life that he, that he got, uh, he read some of the writings of a guy named Varlam. Now Varlam was a, was a Greek, 
Uh, but he was what was called a Latinophrone, a Latin-minded, um, and who essentially embraced the whole uh, uh, developing scholastic theology of Roman Catholicism because there was a great push uh, at that time uh, uh, by, the, by the West to uh, essentially convert the Orthodox to Roman Catholicism. Um, and uh, not that that's ever stopped. Um, and one of the uh, aspects of that was a of, of Varlam's writings, but not just Varlam, but but of the Western tradition, was a very sharp criticism of Eastern monasticism, of Orthodox monasticism. Now, in the West, monasticism was on the decline. Um, instead, you had the uh, uh, these various orders like the Dominicans and the Franciscans growing up who weren't linked to monasteries, but they were also linked to all sorts of other kinds of activities, including education, but also uh, uh, the Inquisition and, and other, other such uh, things. And Varlon decided that uh, having, uh, having visited uh, Mount Athos and having encountered uh, Orthodox monks, that what they were doing was crazy. Um, because these monks thought that they, he said, they thought that they could see the light of God and that they were actually having visions of God and that they were actually being in contact with God. And how could that possibly be? You know, and this is, this is where the Latin scholasticism kicks in. Because what Latin scholasticism did is it took the writings of the ancient Orthodox fathers, both the Latin fathers and the Greek fathers, and it turned it into a, a systematic academic treatise like you'd write in college. Well, okay, think of college boy theology, okay? That's for long. On a sophisticated level, he probably was a good student, you know? Um, but what it is, it's dry academic rationalism. In other words, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's just an extra, it's like, it's like a page of mathematics that, in a practice book. The orthodox theology and the orthodox practice of the Jesus prayer and of hesychasm, which was the movement that Barlaam was, was criticizing, or rather the, the practice that Barlaam was criticizing, is not about some kind of abstract, um, a rationalist, academic exercise. It's not like your math homework. It's about how do we enter into living experience of communion with God? And, 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 and if you look at the writings of the, of the Holy Fathers, you, you find very little that's like math homework. You find very little that's, that's just abstract speculation. You find very little that's just, you know, that really doesn't mean anything. It's all about something practical. Now that practical may be way beyond us spiritually, and we may not be able to grasp it because it's so far beyond us spiritually, but that's because we don't share that rationalist idea that our human mind can comprehend everything. And this is, this is a very important point. And because this is, this is part of the foundation of our very culture that we think that we can understand everything. And in that is only arrogance and conceit. Because the reality is, we can't even begin to understand God. And so what do they do in our culture? 
uh, when it comes to God and, and, the, and the things of the Spirit that they can't understand, they say, well, it must not exist. If I can't understand it, in other words, listen to the pronoun, if I can't understand it, it must not exist. Well, okay. Show, show me a coronavirus. Okay. Show me a coronavirus. Or any other bug like that. Does that mean that if I can't see it, it doesn't exist? No. That's called delusion. What St. Gregory Palamas fought for in his, in his very highly sophisticated theological way was the integrity of the experience of communion with God. And not only how it happens, not only, the theory, not only theories about how it happens, but rather how to do it. Because his works are a jumping off point into deeper and deeper and deeper spiritual experience and deeper and deeper uh, practice of the prayer, of the prayer of Hesychasm. Hesychasm has been with the Orthodox Church since, well, it, as, uh, as something identified uh, since the third century, probably. But what else was Jesus doing when he would, when he would go out into the desert to pray? At night, you think he was you think he was toting books of psalms and things like that with him? Probably not. Do you think he even had to? Do you think he had to even use words? Probably not. Hesychasm is ultimately refers to the prayer of stillness, which is what the word means. Hezekiah means stillness silence and and it refers to that prayer of of deep deep inner stillness in which we enter into that living experience and vision of God now what Varlam objected to was he said these crazy monks they're seeing the, they're seeing some kind of divine light there's no such thing as divine light, he would say. There's created light. God created light, right? There's created light. There's no divine light. It's not, it's not really an experience of God. In other words, he's asserting that it's all in their imagination. And St. Gregory Palamas defended this experience because... When one enters into the depths of prayer, and, and this takes years of, of years and years of development of the practice. There's, this is not this is, you know, orthodoxy is not McDonald's kind of spirituality. It's not it's not you get what you think you might want <laughs> when you you know instantly as you drive up and <clears throat> it takes years and years of working in, on yourself and practice in order to attain to this. But, but what these monks were seeing, as St. Gregory Palamas said, was the vision of the uncreated light of the Godhead. The uncreated light, which is the energy of God. And in seeing that uncreated light of the energy of God, that, me that meant also that they too were filled with that they were filled with that uncreated light that they too were being sanctified that they too were being deified that they too were being uh, transformed and transfigured in their souls and in their minds and their hearts because this is what salvation is 
to be filled with the grace of God and to have that light of God, whether you can perceive it or not, shining in the depths of your soul. Just like Jesus at the Transfiguration. Just like Jesus on the cross, where as St. Paul says, and we saw the and we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The glory is his radiance. So St. Gregory Palamas stood up and in, engaged those who were Latin minded and said, No, you're wrong. And he presented his and he presented his works called the Three Triads, defending not only the experience of the Hesychasts, but pointing out to them where their, their theology of the Holy Trinity was wrong and was off. Because they were neglecting an essential aspect of God, the divine energy. And so, if you listen to the hymns, if you, if you read the, the works of St. Gregory, which are now fairly easily available, if you come to my lectures, <laughs> things like that, we talk, we talk a lot about the, the uncreated divine energy. What is this? It's grace. It's his love. It's his compassion. It's his mercy, which is poured out on us and which we experience. You come into the church and you experience, and you experience holiness. That's the uncreated divine grace of God. And in fact, the, according to St. Paul, the point of our repentance, this is Lent, so we talk about, have to talk about repentance, right? The point of our repentance <laughs> is that our souls become transfigured. That's his word, transfigured. By the renewal of our mind, so that we too shine like Christ at the Transfiguration. Now, 500 years after St. Gregory Palamas, you had St. Seraphim uh, in, the, in the forests of Russia. And I'll close with this. And he had a disciple by the name of Motovilov. And St. Seraphim uh, was living out in a hermitage in the woods, and he was out one day chopping wood, and Motovilov uh, came out there and uh, was talking with him, and so St. Seraphim sat him down on a couple of, of logs or tree stumps, and they had this conversation, and, and Motovilov asked, what is the, what is, what's the point of the Christian life? Why, what, what's, what's this really all about? And St. Seraphim said, it's all about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. And Monobilov says, well, explain it to me. St. Seraphim didn't explain it to him. He looked him straight in the eyes. And he said, what do you see? He said, I see your eyes but as if shining out of the radiance of the sun. Motovilo had that vision in St. Seraphim of that transfiguration of his soul, of the uncreated light shining, shining forth from him. And St. Seraphim said, and you too are shining with that same radiance. Otherwise, you couldn't, you couldn't see me. So we, too, are called to attain to that transfiguration of, of our life, that transfiguration of our soul, of our, of our noose, of our mind, 
and even of our body, which is the ultimate goal that we shall attain to when Christ comes and raises us from the dead and raises us up to be with him in his kingdom, where we in all things will be like him and where we will be, where we will fulfill that, uh, uh, that saying of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect.